Hey everyone and welcome back to another video. In February through early March of this year, I spent 10 days in Belgium visiting my future in-laws who are American citizens living in the country. While this was first and foremost a family visit, I did want to capitalize on the experience as much as possible by trying as many Belgian beers as I could and absorbing as much information as possible. So while this was not a full-fledged beer tourism trip, it was still a fantastic experience that I just want to share with everybody for the purposes of education and obviously entertainment. I dove fully into Belgium's beer culture while I was there, trying some of the rarest and the best beers in the world. I also visited a few Trappist monasteries and even was able to spend a few hours in conversation with a Trappist monk from Chimay, so I am very excited to share with you what I've learned and what I've been inspired to do. At the end of the video, I've also got a full compilation of all of the brewing knowledge that I picked up while I was there and some real inspiration to brew some Belgian ales, so please stick around for that. Belgium isn't usually at the top of the list for most people's ideal European uh, destinations. It's often overlooked in favor of the food of Italy, the art of France, the mountains of Germany, the beaches of Greece, etc, etc. But it does have a very rich history and a unique beer culture. And as a brewer and a lover of both beer and history, it is a phenomenal destination that I would highly recommend. Belgium is nestled between Germany, France, and the Netherlands. And due to its placement, it has been the site of many key events in European history for millennia. In under two hours, one can drive from Leuven, the site of an important defeat of the Vikings in the 9th century, past Waterloo, where Napoleon's conquests were effectively ended in 1815, to the Ardennes Forest, where the last German offensive of World War II was stopped in 1945. In the western part of the country, some of the heaviest fighting of the First World War took place, uh, and the scars of the war are still visible on the landscape. Belgium is a mostly flat country with open farm fields, scattered small towns, and lots of windmills. There are a few large main modern cities uh, such as Brussels and Antwerp, but most of the towns really just have a charming old world feel with brick and stone houses along narrow cobblestone streets and medieval structures. While most Belgians speak a little English, it's best to try and learn uh, the basics of either French or Dutch while you were there, as most people will start talking to you in either of those languages instead of English. Plus, it's just polite. North and west of Brussels, most people speak Flemish, which is a dialect of Dutch. And southeast of Brussels, everybody speaks French. Every town, no matter the size, has a Grand Place, which is typically a large open square with cafes, churches, and administrative buildings surrounding it. This is a phenomenal spot to sit outside and have a beer or two with some classic Belgian food. Seriously, the frites, or fries, are worth it. I also highly recommend croquettes, which are these fried little balls of creamy Abbey cheese, and they will change your life. Also well worth it are moules, or mussels in sauce, or any variation of crook, which is a ham and cheese sandwich on steroids. Uh, if you're in the north, try some Flemish stew as well. Belgian beers pair excellently with all their food, and in fact, most of the dishes are actually made with beer. Belgian beer culture is quite unique, and there is a long list of styles that originate in the country. Trappist styles like single, double, triple, and dark strong ale, blonde, brune, Golden Strong Ale, Wit Beer, Beer de Garde, Flanders Red Ale, Oud Brune, Goose, not to be confused with Gozo, which is different, Creek, Lambic, and Cezanne. Furthermore, these style names are just an attempt by the BJCP to really just categorize Belgian beer. Belgian brewers are notoriously experimental and individualistic, and you can't really just confine them to styles. Most often, beers in Belgium uh, don't really fit into the parameters of the BJCP guidelines. For example, Orval, which is technically a Trappist triple, is actually made with a mixed fermentation of Abbey Ale Yeast and Britannomyces, and would actually score much higher in a competition if you entered it as a Cezanne than as a Belgian triple. One of the most fun aspects of Belgian beer culture is that every single beer made in the country comes with its own glassware, which is specifically designed to best present that specific beer. Some glassware is designed to focus on appearance, showcasing clarity or a fluffy head. Some is designed to funnel aromatics from yeast and spices to your nose, and others are designed as if you're drinking out of a bowl, so you can take a huge draught if your heart so desires. Belgians take their beer very seriously, and this aspect is no exception. In most cafes, you will not be served a beer you order if the appropriate accompanying glassware is not available at that time. 
One of the best parts of the whole experience is how cheap the beer is relative to finding it in the United States. For someone who is used to drinking $10 beers in the Boston area, enjoying a five euro glass of Chimay Blue in Belgium is extremely satisfying. And that's coming from the bar. In fact, a 330 milliliter bottle of Chimay Blue is under two euro at most bottle shops in Belgium. Whereas in the US, my local bottle shop sells it for like seven bucks for a 330 milliliter bottle. Uh, even with a conversion rate, that is a lot more money. Most beer in Belgium is traditionally bottle conditioned and you will be served an open bottle with an empty glass and you pour the beer yourself when you order a beer. Um, but a few beers are served on draft, mostly just the big names and macro beers like Stella Artois, Jupiler, and Leff. However, in some cases you can find some Abbey beers on draft. The most common ones I found were Triple Carmelite, Saint Foyan, and if you find yourself in Chimay, all of Chimay's beers are actually available on draft at the Espace Chimay just down the street from the Abbey. I found this really surprising since one of the most fundamental aspects of Belgian beer is the bottle conditioning process. And many will say that you should never serve an Abbey beer on draft. So while I had the opportunity, I conducted a little experiment and I compared a Chimay White served on draft to one that was bottle conditioned and I was actually really surprised with the results. They were really similar. Uh, in fact, I really couldn't discern a difference between them in flavor, aroma, or appearance, including the quality of the head. The only difference that I found was that the bottle conditioned one had a slightly higher level of carbonation, which you could feel as you drank the beer, but that was it. While I was at Chimay, of course I had the Chimay Red or Premier, the White or Sans Sans, and the Blue or Grand Reserve, which are their uh, double, triple, and dark strong ales respectively. But since I was right next to the Abbey, I also got the chance to try a few extra beers that are very, very hard to find anywhere else. The first was Chimay Gold, or Doré, which is the beer the monks actually intend for themselves as a potter's beer. It is the simplest and the lowest in alcohol of all of them, and it seemed to me like it was a wit beer made with Abbey Ale yeast. And if that's the case, it was simply the best wit beer I have ever had in my entire life. Second was Chimay Green, or saint saint -Con which is a brand new beer, which was brewed for the 150th anniversary of Chimay's brewing at the Scormont Abbey in 2021. And it was an excellent dry, golden strong ale, which seemed to me to be spiced with coriander, although I couldn't tell if it was from the yeast or not. Thirdly, I tried a 2019 Chimay Grand Reserve, which was aged in oak barrels. Uh, and that was a phenomenal beer, which took the already impressive Chimay Blue to a brand new level of complexity. Uh, so I happily gave Chimay a ton of my money and I bought some 750 milliliter bottles of both of those to bring back to the States with me. One note, if you visit the Abbey, I highly recommend the Espace Chimay for their lodging. The bottom floor is a restaurant serving great food with all the aforementioned Chimay beers and cheeses, and the upstairs is actually a little hotel, so if an evening of drinking 10% beers downstairs catches up to you, all you have to do is make it up the stairs to your room. Oh, and the mini bar in the room has all of the Chimay beers and glassware for you to just take home with you if you want. The next day, I had a great opportunity to tour the Scormont Abbey grounds and speak with the Trappist monk, Father Jacques. The conversation was very enlightening, and I learned a lot about monastic brewing and monastic principles. Monastic brewing has been happening ever since the Middle Ages. The typical story is that beer was safer to drink than water at the time due to the plague, and it was largely the drink of choice. However, it was more than likely just a low, uh, very low ABV table beer. Monks brewed beer at the time since they were obligated to provide food and drink for travelers who came through, and beer is what most people drank. Ever since then, monks have been brewing beer, and as they are exceptionally sustainable and self-sufficient, they grew their own barley and hops, and then they gradually began to improve the quality of their beer until it was basically at legendary status. Chimay's Scormont Abbey is an exceptionally peaceful place just outside the Ardennes forest. Just like other abbeys, the monks produce beer and cheese, which they sell to raise money for the abbey primarily. However, Chimay's beer is the most popular and widely distributed of the six Belgian Trappist monasteries by a long shot, so they make significantly more money than the other monasteries. Despite that, well more than half of their profits actually end up being donated to those in need or to help support their order, other abbeys, and the local town. Currently, there are only 14 monks at Chimay. In regards to brewing, their role is very much just supervisory. 
Chimay has over 500 employees that actually handle the supply chain, brewing, packaging, and distribution of the beer, while the monks are really just there to make sure that everything is just kind of happening properly. Unfortunately, Chimay wasn't allowing anybody to enter the brewery in the time I visited, uh, likely due to COVID concerns, so I was unable to actually see the operation, but there is plenty of video evidence of that, uh, specifically on Chimay's YouTube channel, so if you want to check that out, go check that out. Regardless, I was extremely happy to have the opportunity to talk with Frère Jacques and to taste some incredible Chimay beer right at the source. Chimay was not the only Trappist monastery I visited, though. I also got the chance to go to the Saint Sixtus Abbey in Westfliterin. This is one of the oldest Trappist monasteries in the country and is perhaps the most exclusive. Their beer is only available for pickup from their gift shop a few days each week, and they almost always run out before the day is up, making it very hard to acquire. However, if you don't manage to pick up your beer from the shop, you can drink their beer at the cafe while it's open, which is exactly what we did. We didn't make it in time to get any of the blonde at the shop, but we got a bunch of the 12, which is their dark strong ale, and routinely is voted as one of the top five beers in the world every single year. Of course, we stuck around the gift shop to enjoy the other beers that we couldn't take back with us, such as the six of the blonde and the eight, their double. Let me tell you, the eight was fantastic. But the West Fleeter in 6 and 12 are among my favorite beers I have ever had in my entire life. And they are extraordinarily complex and extremely drinkable, and I count myself lucky to have experienced them at the source. It is also worth mentioning that their cheese was among the best I had in the entire trip, and I ate a shameful amount of cheese. Similar to Chimay Scormont Abbey, the Saint Sextus Abbey is located in a very peaceful and off the beaten path location. It is just outside of Ypres in Flanders, and after you leave the highway, it takes 20 minutes of driving down single-lane farm roads, dodging chickens, cattle, tractors, and old men on bicycles. Very much like Treehouse Brewing in Massachusetts, beer fans will line up outside the gift shop to take crates of beer with them home, often leaving empty-handed as the beer runs out. However, one very important distinction should be made here. While West Lutheran and other monasteries do profit off of their beer sales, they are not really all that concerned with beer sales. They are monasteries, first and foremost, and breweries, secondly. Therefore, they make however much they want to make, and they choose not to keep up with demand, which in my opinion makes their beer that much better and more special. If they were operating like a for-profit commercial brewery, they would have expanded significantly by now and started to change their beer, but instead they have kept their beer at a world-class level and have kept the monastery as the priority, and I think there is something extremely pure about that. There are six beer brewing Trappist monasteries in Belgium. Chimay, West Vliteren, West Mal, Orval, Rochefort, and Akel. I was fortunate enough to try beer from all of them, but they only make up a handful of the over 3,000 beers available in Belgium. However, there are a significantly larger number of similar quality beers to the Trappists in a category known as Abbey beers. Some of these, such as Valdu, are still made by monks. They are just simply not Cistercian Trappist monks. But most Abbey beers fall into a slightly different situation. They were at one time functioning brewing monasteries, but have since transitioned into full-on production breweries. Some good examples of this are Maridsou, saint foyan and saint Bonadus. While these beers may not necessarily all be made by monks, they certainly still taste like they are, and they largely use the same brewing principles and are still well worth trying. I focused my beer tastings this trip largely on Trappist and Abbey beers, and still didn't even make a dent in all of the beers available in Belgium. And, but that's mostly because Trappist and Abbey styles are really just my favorites of the bunch. As I mentioned before, there are a number of non-Trappist and non-Abbey styles of mixed and wild fermentation beers that are all over the country, including some incredibly complex Goose and Lambic style beers in Flanders. And I got a chance to try both Timmermans Goose and Oud Brun while I was in Bruges. Belgian sour beers are not simply kettle sours or Philly sours that are done in a week or two, but rather are made the hard way with mixed culture fermentations that take years to complete, and then are blended with newer batches of the same beer or with totally different beers that creates something extraordinary complex at the end. And whether you like sour beers or not, the process is really worthy of respect, and it is truly fascinating. Since I focused on the Abbey beers this trip, I didn't get to try too many of these kinds of beers, but I will be putting a lot more effort into these categories the next time when I visit. So now I would like to provide the so what for brewers who are watching this video. This video is more than just a trip report. So here is a compilation of the knowledge and brewing principles that I've picked up related to brewing Trappist and Abbey style beers. 
These beers were developed by monks, and if there is one thing that screams monastic principles, it is simplicity. Simplicity in design and simplicity in execution. The monks do not overcomplicate any aspect of their lives, so why would their beer be complicated? I don't think their dark strong ales contain 10 malts and sugars, and they aren't adding weird things to their beers to get extra flavors. Sometimes, very rarely, they will add a little bit of spice to their beers, but only just enough to accent the beer, never to throw the balance off. As Stan Hieronymus says, if you can confidently identify that a spice has been added to the beer, it's probably too much. So keep simplicity in mind as you're developing your Belgian ale recipes. Secondly, local ingredients are used by the monks. Most are sourcing their malt from Dingemans, making their own candy sugar, and using local Goldings hops that are grown in Belgium. It is important to use Belgian malts, high quality candy sugar, and European hops when making these beers. Hops such as Styrian Goldings, Hallertau, and Saz are all good choices, or Magnum to Bitter. If the beer is lighter in color, typically it's going to be hopped to a higher level than the darker ones, which are a little bit more malty. For their water, all the monasteries are using largely balanced water profiles with high bicarbonate levels, which is very good brewing water. They do treat their water though before brewing with it and they are not really massively modifying it like you might for something like an American IPA. These beers don't need that sort of thing. A light and balanced water profile will likely be better for brewing these beers than a heavy malt biased one. The mash should really be a step mash. That is really the only way to get such a light bodied beer with a huge level of head retention and quality with a high alcohol level as well. And this technique is used by virtually all of the Belgian breweries. You can still get away with a single temperature rest, but it should be a very low and very long rest to create as fermentable of a wort as possible. And you probably aren't going to end up getting that head quality and lacing that you would get if you did a step mash. Lastly, Trappist yeasts are all readily available for the home brewer. So West Vliteren and West Mall both use the same yeast, which is available as Weiss 3787 Trappist High Gravity, WLP 530 Abbey Yeast, or Imperial Triple Double. Chimay's yeast is available as Weiss 1214 Belgian Abbey Ale, WLP 500 Trappist Ale, Imperial Monastic, or Fermentus T58. Rochefort is available as Weiss 1762 Belgian Abbey 2, or WLP 540 Abbey Ale 4. I'm not quite sure of Ockel's strains or of Orval's, but Orval's can be sort of approximated by pitching a Brett Bruck strain with an Abbey strain. If dry yeast is your preference, Fermentus T58 Dry Yeast or Lalamand Abbey Ale are great options for any of these beers. Of course, there's also plenty of other Belgian brewers' yeasts uh, that are available for home brewers, such as La Chouf, uh, whose strain is available as Weiss 3522 Ardennes, WLP 550 Belgian Ale, and Imperial Gnome. Duvel's strain is Weiss 1388 Belgian Strong Ale, uh, WLP 570 Belgian Golden Ale. DuPont's strain is Weiss 3724 Belgian Cezanne, or WLP 565 Cezanne Ale. And Hogarden's Whitbeer strain is Weiss 3944 WLP 400 Belgian Wit, or Imperial Whiteout. When making Abbey beers, one should really ensure that they understand the temperature capabilities of the yeast that they use. Some Abbey brewers will push their yeast to the absolute edge of the temperature range, and some will let them only get a little bit warmer. All of them, though, do seem to incorporate some sort of ramping schedule or free rise in the fermentation, some getting even as hot as 85 degrees Fahrenheit. I think I will be incorporating some of these ideas into my Abbey Ale fermentations in the future, but if so, I am going to pitch a lot of extra yeast to help clean up all of those fusel alcohols that will be produced. If the fusels successfully get converted into esters, then the beer will be much more complex and flavorful, and if not, it could taste pretty awful. Most Abbey beers seem to have a pretty fast primary fermentation, pitching a ton of yeast cold, letting it free rise to a high temperature, and then completing its primary fermentation in about a week. After this, they're cold conditioned and lagered for a short period of time, usually only a few weeks. And after this stage, then they are bottled with fresh yeast and sugar being added to the bottle. Uh, and then they are bottle conditioned, or as they say, re-fermented, uh, which happens warm and for about three to four weeks. And after that, they are ready to serve. This is the schedule that I would recommend following uh, since it seems to be pretty much the norm. Um, there's a little bit of a fluctuation depending on the beer style, uh, but it's not too hard to replicate for yourself. Now I'm gonna be kegging my beer probably, um, but I am gonna treat the keg like it's a big bottle and I will follow the same exact conditioning regimen in the keg uh, and hopefully that gets us pretty much where we need to be. 
For some more details about Belgian beer culture, Trappists, Abbey Brewing, and stuff like that, I really do recommend reading Brew Like a Monk by Stan Hieronymus uh, from cover to cover. I read it a second time in anticipation of this trip and it really helped me prepare for the experience uh, and it allowed me to kind of appreciate the beers a little bit more as I drank them. And yes, I have been exceptionally motivated to brew some more Belgian beers. So my intention is to do a series of non-sour Belgian beers over the next several months. Uh, the Kvyk series will still be happening as well, but I can't resist applying all the knowledge that I've learned, so please look out for some of those beers coming out in the future. And once again, I highly recommend visiting Belgium for more reasons than just the beer. I had a phenomenal experience, and it is a beautiful country with a lot to offer. We saw the beautiful 15th century cathedral at Mons, and drank beer at the Grand Place in Mons, and also traveled to the charming town of Chimay, spent time in Bastogne, which is a really fun town, visited the Bastogne War Museum, and also drove south to spend a few days in Paris and drank a whole bunch of Bordeaux. Uh, then we headed north to West Blitheren and spent lots of time uh, there. Then we went to one of the coolest zoos I've ever been to in Paradisa, where a lemur decided to jump on my head. That was awesome. Uh, and then we visited the stunning 13th century city of Bruges, which is one of the only European cities left uh, untouched by both world wars. And it, there is a tremendous amount of medieval buildings in that city. It is a gorgeous place to be. Uh, if you ever get the opportunity to go to this country, it's really well worth it. And I'm very happy I got the chance to. Thank you for sticking around and listening to me. So here is a montage of every beer I tried on this trip. So please enjoy. Thank you for being here and cheers.